Well, hello everybody. This is Clive Lawton here. Um, strange days, aren't they? This is Yom HaShoah, the day of memorial for the Holocaust. Uh, it's full name, the day of memorial for the Holocaust and the ghetto fighters or ghetto resistance. Um, the topic I chose was making sense of the Holocaust. When I mentioned this to a friend, they said, well, you're not going to get very far with that because there is no sense to the Holocaust. It was mad. Um, and of course, there are a number of dilemmas when you want to think about it, because on one hand, you could just simply dismiss it as a period of madness. That's how some people in Germany explained it to themselves when they kind of woke up after the Nazi era and, and thought, how did we how did we get into that? Um, there are lots of dilemmas. Uh, does one talk about the Holocaust in relation to individual stories and individual lives and, and therefore be in danger of losing sense of its scale? Or, or do you talk about it in terms of its scale, uh, statistics, and, and therefore lose sight of, of the individual realities? Do we want to argue that it could happen anywhere? It, it was just a coincidence or an unfortunate historical reality that it started in Germany, or do we want to argue that it was specific to Germany and couldn't have happened anywhere else? Do we want to suggest that it could happen any time? Um, it could happen now. Uh, or was it something very specific to the circumstances in 1930s uh, Europe? Do we want to suggest that the Holocaust is the logical outcome of anti-Semitism? It, it was bound to happen. Or, or do we want to suggest that it's the logical outcome of racism? that sooner or later it will happen somewhere else to another group was the logical outcome of prejudice uh, do we distinguish between prejudice and racism all of those all of those dilemmas i hope to come back to before we finish this session making sense of the holocaust the first thing to say i suppose is that we do need to inform ourselves that's not to say, of course, that we should not commemorate and mourn the victims of the Holocaust. That's a thing that doesn't require any informing, as it were. Uh, millions of people died. Um, I suppose the one piece of information you might find moves you still more is that a huge proportion of those millions were children. Uh, about one and a half million children out of the six million Jews who were killed in the Holocaust. Um, that's very rare that so large a proportion of children are wiped out. Um, this tells you of the racial intensity of the Nazi Holocaust. That is, they didn't just want to kill a lot of people because they felt they were enemies in some way or for whatever reason. That might happen if they were going for political enemies or, uh, or indeed racial enemies. They just wanted to ethnically cleanse the place. Uh, but here there was a doctrine that said that Jews must not survive and therefore the determination to go after even little baby Jews uh, means to say that a huge proportion of children died, uh, an unlikely proportion, um, something like a quarter of the total. Um, and that being the case, of course, we know that Jews are the one ethnic group of all and of course many other groups suffered larger casualties the russians probably suffered many more than six million dead in the war um the chinese did um but the proportion of children has meant that the jews are the only group that have failed to make up their numbers since the holocaust so in the 70 odd years since the end uh, we haven't replenished our numbers yet indeed we're still far smaller than we were before the war there were an estimated 18 million Jews before the war. There's an estimated 13, 14 million Jews now. Um, uh, and that's largely because of the killing of children. So you wipe out a whole generation of potential child-bearing uh, uh, descendants. Well, um, so we don't need to inform ourselves too much to mourn. Um, it's just tragic and horrific and that's all there is to it. But if we want to understand, if we want to make statements about whether this is uh, something that applies in other circumstances or 
is typical of Jewish history or whatever. We, many of us sat at seders just recently and said, in every generation, people have arisen who want to destroy the Jewish people. <clears throat> Did we just kind of shrug and say to ourselves, well, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's what happens. And the Holocaust is another one of those. There are always people who say, but I warned you, I knew it would happen. Uh, so was it a kind of logical outcome? Was it just stupid of people to not realize that the Holocaust was bound to happen? Um, so I think we just need to do a little bit of thinking, a little bit of information in order to give ourselves some framework so that we can try and understand not why things happened entirely, but certainly what happened exactly, um, and a little bit more of a grip on why things went the way they did. So you will come across people who say, I warned of this ages ago. Um, and, and that, after all, is uh, a bit like people in today's coronavirus thing saying, I warned there would be a pandemic and nobody did anything about it. We should have stockpiled huge amounts of whatever it is, ventilators or PPE or something. And uh, now we're feeling a bit foolish. Why, why didn't we think about this? Why didn't we do that? Uh, but of course, at the time, that warning may have sounded like one of many warnings uh, in lots of different directions. Uh, no doubt in 1980, people were warning of a hundred different things on which we could spend millions of pounds stockpiling and preparing just in case this or that happened. But if it had become clear that we'd spent millions of pounds on, I don't know, ventilators in the 1990s, no doubt somebody would have got it in the neck for not spending those millions of pounds on, I don't know, unemployment benefit or something, uh, instead of huge amounts of useless ventilators. Uh, now, of course, we know differently, but uh, hindsight is an easy thing. So when people said that they knew that the Holocaust was bound to happen, the future of the Jews in Europe was doomed, uh, where does that idea come from? Well, of course, in the 1880s and 1890s, there was a huge upheaval of Jews from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Poland and Russia and uh, Lithuania and around there. Uh, something like two million Jews got up and left as a result of the pogroms and the worsening situation for Jews in the uh, Tsarist uh, Empire. Um, and they headed west. Almost all of them were trying to get to America. I mean, nobody uh, picked up in, I don't know, wherever, some shtetl and go, oh, I'd love to live in Grimsby. Uh, they weren't heading for England. But of course, many of them took the journey in stages. They didn't have much money. Uh, and eventually they stopped off wherever they got to. And they thought, well, this will do, or, or they simply couldn't afford to go any further. Uh, so although the aim for pretty well all of them was to get to America, uh, many spread themselves across Western Europe. And uh, as we know, many of our ancestors ended up in Britain as a result of that movement over two or three decades, uh, Jews moving from Eastern Europe. Did they leave because they thought they were all going to die if they stayed? There were pogroms, uh, there were massacres, uh, the numbers who were mostly in tens, so sometimes in hundreds. Um, and quite probably Jews did indeed, uh, to some level, shrug and think uh, it was always thus. Um, we've had to put up with this kind of thing uh, over the centuries. Uh, and we know that in Europe over the centuries, there's been a gen general rule of thumb. Um, you live for a hundred years in a place uh, tolerably well, uh, whether it's the thousands or the 1100s or the 1200s or the 1300s or whatever it is. You live for a hundred years uh, roughly there. The local ruler is okay. You learn to keep your balance in the circumstances. Um, and then along comes some utter nutcase who's decided he's going for the Jews. When that happens, he takes power, he becomes king, whatever he is. Uh, he attacks the local Jews or he stirs up the local mob or it could be a pope or a bishop or whoever. He stirs up the local mob and Jews at that point uh, take one of two usual courses of action. Uh, they keep their heads down, they hide, they keep quiet, they take their losses, uh, they stay where they are, whatever. And after about 10 years, that nut has had his come up and he's been shifted out from somewhere. Uh, he's been forced to leave. Um, and uh, then that's, that's him dealt with for now. Uh, 
Uh, and the Jews go back to their lives. They re-emerge from their hiding places. They get back to their jobs and so on. A good example of that, perhaps, was um, York in 1190. We all know about the York Massacre. Uh, probably about 150 Jews died in the York Massacre. What most people don't know is that within about 10 or 15 years, the Jews were back living in York in larger numbers than they'd been living there before. Uh, re-established themselves, didn't re-establish their scholarship, but they re-established themselves economically and socially and so forth. Uh, and Jews continued living in England for another hundred years or so before they were expelled. So that's one option. Keep your head down, keep out the way, take your losses, re-establish yourself after that particular uh, maniac has got out. The, way. the alternative is move to another place. Um, leave England, go live in France, and you know that 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 will do for uh, a while till that maniac's been shoved out the way and a new ruler's taken over. And then you can move back uh, and re-establish yourself. If you're expelled from the country, well, move to the next local nearby country and establish yourself there. You've always got some kinds of connections. You can do that, and that's roughly how Jews have lived over the last thousand years in Europe. Uh, either keep your head down for a while or move next door uh, and uh, and that's how you survive. Again in Spain 1492 the Jews were expelled um, they moved to Portugal in large numbers that would do but of course they didn't expect was that the Inquisition would follow them to Portugal uh, so then they moved to Morocco or or try to get around um, the Mediterranean in different ways um, sit it out or move to another place and carry on like that of course, in the Shoah, uh, at one level, um, that uh, sit it out for 10 years, um, this maniac will go to, nobody lasts that long, uh, was roughly right. Um, Hitler lasted about 12 years from 1933 to 45, but he was gone um, within a decade and a bit. Uh, so that bit worked. Um, lots of people did exactly the right thing. They moved to the next country. Um, Famously, Anne Frank's family moved from Germany to Holland uh, to safety, they thought. Um, lots of people did that. Um, people took refuge, didn't they, from mainland Europe to Britain. They sent their children in the kinder transport. Some refugees managed to get here. Of course, if uh, the Nazis had invaded Britain and taken it over, the story would have been very different. Um, so in every case, that uh, move somewhere else, uh, is one option. The other option is keep your head down, uh, go into hiding. That was the Frank family option, for example. Um, ally yourself with your non-Jewish neighbours who might uh, look after you or help you out. There are some people who manage that. Um, go into the woods, uh, become partisans, and, or don't become partisans, just, just hide. Um, there's another option of that. What nobody expected, of course, was the industrial scale and ideological intensity of the destruction. So it is true that after 10 years or so, people emerged blinking from white, but they looked around and they found 6 million corpses. Uh, nobody ever had experienced that. And I think it is probably true to say that nobody had imagined it either. Uh, even those people who say, you know, Jewish life is no longer sustainable in Europe, we must leave. I don't think they expected those millions of deaths. Uh, and indeed, we know by looking at Nazi records that although Hitler fulminated against the Jews in his Mein Kampf from the 1920s, uh, and he certainly indicated that he wanted to rid Europe of Jews, uh, his original intention was not to kill them all, but just to get them out or something. Uh, and it was taking over Poland and discovering himself with millions and millions of Jews uh, in the countries that he occupied eastwards uh, that led them to have to shift their policy to a more murderous one. Um, and we all know the consequences of that. So why did uh, the Nazis go after the Jews? Uh, many people know about racial theory and they know that this was racist anti-Semitism. This wasn't anything to do with Christian doctrine fundamentally, although many people would argue that the ground had been prepared in Europe um, by uh, Christian anti-Semitism through the centuries. But this was racist anti-Semitism. This 
argued that somehow the Jews were a different breed. Uh, where did this idea come from? And why did it matter? Uh, after all, we're all familiar with the kind of racism that sets uh, white people against black people. Um, that kind of racism is uh, kind of easy to observe, really. You just get out a color card and uh, rate people from light to dark. Uh, and that way you establish uh, different sorts of people. You have people who are white, they never are really, they're just blotchy pink. Uh, and you have people who are black, and very few of those actually, they're maybe dark brown or whatever. And you have people in between who are pale brown or um, olive skinned or whatever it might be. Um, and you create your own hierarchy. <clears throat> There's no science to this, but it's kind of a mock science. And it bases itself on some kind of Darwinian survival of the fittest, law of the jungle kind of thing. And you assert that the whitest people, these are your Aryans, your blonde, blue-eyed, upstanding, strapping, Viking, Nordic types, unless of course you're a Hitler or Goebbels or something, you could be a little dark and so forth. It doesn't seem to matter. Um, but anyway, you have your upright Aryans um, <clears throat> and those guys are in charge. And then you go down through the, the packing order uh, and you've got your blackest of the black at the bottom of it, and those guys do as they're told. Uh, and that's, uh, what shall we say, a natural system would be the thing. And if everybody knows their place and keeps to their tasks, the world can go on well enough. That's the way God made it, if you like. Um, that's a bit like saying, you know, that lions eat gazelles, and so long gazelles know that they're going to be eaten, uh, they'll breed enough gazelles for lions and... Um, but if somebody starts the gazelle liberation front, well, then, you know, the jungle's in trouble, isn't it? And what do the lions do then? Uh, you can't have gazelles claiming they've got rights uh, you know, not to be eaten by lions. That's a kind of a nonsense. Um, and a similar sort of theory exists there. You know, let's face it, gazelles aren't going to demand their rights. And in the same way, you know, blacks aren't going to demand their rights. Aren't they? they're, they're not clever enough, you would argue, with those racial theory. They're not clever enough to think that they should have rights anyway. They just slap heavy stuff here and there, and that's fine. And then brown people probably can do bits of administration, but they, they need white Aryan people to uh, you know, make things happen and decide on stuff. And so long as everybody knows their place, that's how it goes. Well, a few people die, but it's not the worst thing in the world. That's that kind of racial theory. Now, notice, the Jews are not in this system. You don't define Jews by color. You don't define Jews as being uh, better or worse or top or bottom or black or white. So where are the Jews in this system? Really important to understand this. The Jews are not at the very bottom of the heap, subhuman to the extent that they're even worse than black people. The Jews are outside of the human system altogether. To this extent, they take on the old, old teaching of the kind of devilish, demonic, non-human element of the Jews. And they argue that the Jews are some kind of wily uh, manipulator of the human race altogether. Well, <clears throat> that's why you get words like uh, bacillus or cancer or virus or whatever, that the Jews are working on the human body, the human body being this great system of uh, uh, Aryan white human beings, as it were, as the head, um, and blacks as their schlepping muscular arms, and um, you know, other people playing other parts in the sort of human body. Well, how can Jews take over the world when the master race is in charge? I mean, if the master race is the master race, then surely they should have nothing to worry about from Jews. How can Jews possibly defeat the master race? Well, you can't argue that Jews are somehow cleverer than the master race or stronger. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, then the master race isn't the master race. So what do you do? Well, what you argue is that the Jews mix up the system. The Jews provoke the gazelles into founding the gazelle liberation front. Uh, human rights for aardvarks, you know, that kind of thing. And by stirring up the system, you make it so difficult for anybody to uh, run 
the natural order. The Aryans can no longer manage the ordinary way, the way it ought to be, um, that in fact everything gets tipped over. And when that is confused, then the Jews can move in. So as a result, there was a widespread conviction, Hitler says it himself, uh, and argues uh, in Nazi doctrine that it's the Jews who give rise to concepts like uh, human rights. I don't want to be anachronistic, of course, because human rights as a concept didn't fully blossom until after the war, uh, not least as a result of trying to respond to the Nazi era. Um, but nevertheless, human rights was very much driven by uh, Jewish thinkers um, uh, and uh, we know that uh, it was a Jewish lawyer, French Jewish lawyer, who drove the uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Come to that, it was a Jewish doctor, uh, doctor uh, from Poland who drove the concept of children's rights. Um, these sorts of ideas were uh, anathema to a Nazi doctrine um, and they would have wanted to argue that human rights is absurd. Different human beings have different kinds of rights. Um, so they argued that Jews, by asserting this kind of argument that all human beings are equal, uh, had not only um, disrupted the human system, but made it possible for Jews to kind of get into uh, human order and try and take over. Um, there's a great line from Mein Kampf, which I would love to have up on every Jewish wall. I'm so proud of it. I hope it looks right. He says, conscience was a Jewish invention. Oh, wonderful claim. Isn't that marvelous? Conscience was a Jewish invention. Wouldn't we love it to be true? And, and based on that, has an almost mystical conviction about the essential nature of the Jewish people. Notice. Notice, he was not saying this about Christianity. He felt he could come to deals with the Christians. He could do deals with the church. He could somehow manage the, um, what should we say, the temporal power, the political frames of the church. Uh, and indeed, when Hitler went to the Oberammergau Passion Play uh, in Germany uh, in the 1930s, and he saw the story depicted in this drama uh, of the Easter story, um, he loved the fact, he argued that what needed to happen was they needed to Aryanize Christianity and de-Judaize it. That is, get rid of all of its uh, Jewish influences. Uh, what does it mean? Things like, you know, kindness and charity and that sort of stuff uh, and make a more robust uh, Nazi Christianity, if you like. Well, he could imagine that kind of thing. Um, he managed somehow to accommodate the Mufti of Jerusalem. I don't quite know how he, uh, how he felt about Islam. But nevertheless, one way or another, he felt that the uh, problems of humanity uh, were Jewish problems because um, Jews had infiltrated this uh, idea of human rights and equality. And that was all a nefarious plot by the Jews to take over the world. Um, so... Jews are at the bottom of this heap, and that's why, so long as there is one little baby Jew left alive, Nazis could not relax. The Third Reich was not safe. Well, wouldn't that be lovely if that was actually true? Uh, the Jews are so naturally opposed to Nazism that so long as there is a Jew left on the planet, Nazism can't flourish. Well, I mean, it's mad, isn't it? But it's got its own weird internal logic. Um, and that's why Jews are continuously being seen, still, by neo-Nazis and uh, uh, Nazi racist theorists, um, uh, uh, are seen as the problem behind everything, the plotters, the conspirators, uh, trying to upset the natural order um, in order to prevent whites from dominating. So although we're very conscious of the racist nature of uh, right-wing ideologies, um, that's, uh, what should we say, a symptom. Uh, uh, but deep down, uh, in theory anyway, 
whites are not supposed to be afraid of black people, brown people, because they are inferior in that kind of racial thing. What they're afraid of is the way in which Jews uh, are going to undermine the system and therefore manipulate their way into control and into power. And this, of course, gives rise to the second thing that I think British people particularly uh, have um, obscured in their thinking. Uh, and this is the variety of different camps uh, that the Nazis established. And we're all familiar with the fact that concentration camps were invented by the British. Uh, the British created concentration camps uh, in the Boer War in South Africa. Uh, and they were not pleasant places by any measure of means. The idea of a concentration camp, the very name, uh, tells us that it works in a way uh, opposite to uh, the standard prison that we're familiar with. When you have a prison, you put all your prisoners into separate cells uh, and you keep them apart. Uh, and you have your warders walking up and down corridors um, and that's how you manage your prisoner uh, population. In a concentration camp, uh, you don't do that. You don't keep them separate. You cram them all into a kind of central area. You concentrate them. Uh, and in a sense, they can kind of get up to whatever they like in that uh, central area. You don't really care. Uh, and then you surround them with guards, uh, and in that way you keep them under control. It's a more efficient, uh, less costly process. Uh, and indeed, when Hitler opened his first concentration camp in Dachau, uh, he had a press conference, and uh, the world's media came to have a look and see if this was a good way to organize prisons in future. It's just another system, isn't it? Concentration camp by itself does not suggest death and destruction and so on. And indeed, early concentration camps had hospital wings and educational resources and all those kinds of things. If the regime that runs them, of course, is brutal, but then that's the same as a regular prison. A brutal regime can result in brutal destruction of prisons. Uh, but in principle, anyway, a concentration camp by itself um, was not an invention of the Nazis, as I say, started by the British, uh, not an invention by the Nazis, um, uh, hasn't disappeared since. Uh, we all remember those pictures in Srebrenica, um, uh, and we can be fairly sure that they exist in other parts of the world uh, in various uh, totalitarian and repressive regimes. Um, concentration camps, uh, they exist. Why have they become the watchword for horror? Well, I think this year is a particularly good year to bear this in mind because uh, this is the uh, 75th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen was a concentration camp. Um, and until the last months of the war, it was a tolerable concentration camp. I don't mean to say you would have been pleased to go there. Uh, and many people did die and there was disease and there was starvation. And Nobody was trying too hard to keep everybody alive. But nevertheless, uh, there was a reasonable amount of space. There was a reasonable amount of accommodation. There was theoretically food for everybody. Uh, what really went wrong in Bergen-Belsen is that in the last months of the, uh, of the war, uh, retreating Nazis brought to Belsen uh, huge numbers of prisoners. Uh, at that they withdrew from the lands that they were abandoning uh, and crammed them in to bergen uh, So again, I've mentioned the Frank family, for example. We know that uh, Anne and her sister Margot were brought to Belsen in the last months of the war from Auschwitz um, and they died there of disease. Well, of course, as more and more thousands were crammed into Belsen, and the SS lost complete control of the camp, uh, and typhus raged, uh, there was disease, there was hunger, starvation, uh, and thousands and thousands died. Uh, and that happened in some other concentration camps as well. Uh, but for the British, of course, it was the one that the British liberated. And it's the one that we and our documentary makers filmed. And so for Britain, Belsen became the archetype of Nazi horror. For the British, uh, the skeletal, barely surviving figure, the piles of bodies, uh, 
uh, became the image and Belson became the word uh, for um, a summary of everything that was wrong with the Nazi regime. Um, of course, we didn't really know very much, it must be said, about the six death camps in Poland. Those were all taken over by the Russians. Uh, they were not liberated uh, by the uh, Western powers. Um, and so the idea of the death camps, although obviously information had come through to the West, uh, we hadn't witnessed uh, or made our own assessment of what was happening in those places. And given that very, very quickly, the Cold War started, uh, there was an instinct to disbelieve anything that the Soviets told us anyway, because of course it was in their uh, political outlook uh, to demonize everything the Nazis did uh, in any circumstances. So given the combination of survivors not really much wanting to talk about their experience, other people not wanting to listen anyway, even if they did want to talk about it, not believing what the Soviets would tell you about anybody, rehabilitating the Germans in order to get the West, uh, Western side robust in West Germany. Uh, all of those things uh, led us to not listen very much to the death camps. Let's remember then that as far as the Holocaust is concerned, the Nazi uh, unique contribution to world civilization, if you want to call it, was the death camps. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, nobody before or since has devised camps deliberately designed to do the maximum number of people to death by the most efficient industrial methods you can think of. There have been concentration camps in, there probably still are, as I say. We all know about the gulags in the Soviet Union. We know about heartless, grim slave camps here and there, refugee camps, we may feel terribly embarrassed by the conditions in which refugees are kept in Europe uh, as a result of our own fear of giving them a better uh, go in life. Um, all of that, uh, but those do not match the death camps. And you will find again and again that uh, people refer to the death camps as concentration camps because that's the uh, British uh, contact through bergen -Basel. So try and keep in your mind uh, that racial theory that makes the Jews the uh, unique, specific enemy. It means to say, uh, as Lucy Davidovich uh, said, I think, um, while not all the victims of the Nazis were Jews, all the Jews were victims of the Nazis. That unique determination to wipe out the Jews, not because of what they were doing, well, not because of what they were actually doing, what they imagined to be doing, uh, not because of what they were actually doing, uh, not because of their um, political views or because they'd taken up arms against the Nazis or because they were members of opposing political parties or any of those reasons, or indeed because uh, they wouldn't swear allegiance to the state. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses or, or um, uh, uh, communists or those kinds of people. And gay people could be argued to be somehow uh, uh, degenerate and destroying a robust society um, but the Jews were seen to be this uniquely malevolent plotting conspiratorial group and you still hear that kind of talk in some of the ghastly nonsense that uh, spews out on the internet from time to time from conspiracy theorists uh, hard right um, idiots uh, who have still uh, believe that this kind of nonsense makes sense so remember the racial thing, remember the death camps, their unique quality, uh, nothing like that. Uh, so the first one and a half million or so of the Jews to be killed were killed in mass massacres. We all know the pictures of the, uh, of the mass graves, the people being lined up and shot, uh, taken off to the forests and killed there. Uh, that in a sense, uh, ghastly that was, was not new to European history and probably is uh, not yet wiped out from human history. You know, massacring a group of people, taking them, uh, emptying a village and destroying them all. Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing in some ways that uh, might have happened to the Rishingas in Burma if they hadn't uh, escaped into refugee camps in uh, uh, Bangladesh. Um, 
Um, those kinds of things happen. Uh, those kinds of massacres, of course, it was a massive uh, national effort to kill the one and a half million Jews that they found as they entered into the Soviet Union. But the death camps uh, was a very different systematic utilization of all modern skills, uh, the conveyor belt, the production line system, uh, which had been developed in industry in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries, the use of communications, railways, telegraph, the use of propaganda, uh, cinema, posters, printing, uh, the use of all of those things that we think of, the use of law, um, the use of all of those things that we think of as potentially uh, tools of civilization uh, were used by the Nazis to destroy the Jews. Well, that does make the Holocaust unique so far in human history. Uh, and it does mean that it was not the logical outcome of anti-Semitism. The logical outcome of anti-Semitism potentially uh, was more pogroms here or there, more massacres here or there, more expulsions here or there, uh, more escapes of Jews here or there. Uh, but this process was a process that could only happen in the developing industrial world in uh, Europe with all of the resources of emerging modern uh, civilization, technology, and so on. So could it happen at any time? Uh, yes, quite possibly, although we might want to argue that we've got more access to media, so fewer things can happen secretly. But uh, actually, of course, um, we don't know what happened in Wuhan in China, even now. We can't be sure that we have all the information we need. Um, and we still don't know what's happened in Xinjiang there uh, to, the, uh, um, to the Muslims in uh, Western China. We have no real idea, just rumors. So could this happen somewhere nowadays? Quite possibly. Um, do we pay attention to individuals or to statistics, to scale? Well, both, of course, because remember the great rabbinic teaching that he who destroys one life is as, is as if he has destroyed the whole world. He who saves one life is as if he has saved the whole world. The principle here is that each life is infinitely valuable. Uh, and therefore, we can't put a number uh, and 10 times infinity is still just infinity. Six million infinities are still just infinity. So we need to pay attention to infinity, but that's one individual, or it's six million individuals, or it's six million people altogether. And was this a madness? Well, clearly there was some kind of collective loss of conscience, a Jewish invention, let's remember. Uh, of some kind of collective madness. And I'm not saying it's the same at all. Uh, but we can see how readily people leap to joining the authorities in condemning their neighbours, either out of acts of self-righteousness or just to get their own back on people they didn't really like or just to feel important. Because uh, so many people do feel powerless and alienated in the modern society. And at the root of all of this, of course, is the readiness to believe that human beings are somehow not essentially, fundamentally, basically, utterly equal. Well, let's remember that we're not. There's fat and thin, short and tall, clever and stupid, black and white, male and female, all of those things. When we say people are equal, we're talking about something metaphysical, not something you can measure. I'd say we're talking about the soul. I don't know what a secular person would say, why they would argue that human beings are equal. Uh, but the doctrine of human rights, that all people are created equal, let's not worry about the creator. That there's a brotherhood of man, let's not worry about the father. Uh, but that principle insists that you cannot treat another human being in a manner in which you would not expect treated 
yourself. The rest, as Hillel said, is commentary. Go and learn it. Thank you.